Franklin said, go right to his office and visit him, ask questions about operations, but you are required to bring him cookies when you visit, and he prefers chocolate chips, so uh, don't forget. Uh, Chapel family, I, we do have a couple more announcements that I mostly forgot, but one that I, is, I do remember is next week at the 11 o'clock service, this service, we're going to be farewelling the porters. That's me and my family. Um, so if you don't know who the porters are, and so if you're here, make sure to hug everybody goodbye. Uh, we certainly uh, enjoy the chapel community here and uh, we'll miss the community. Our call to worship today is from Matthew chapter 2, and these are the words of John the Baptist. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Please rise if you are able and join in singing hymn number 138, Holy Ground. 138. Almighty God, we thank you for Jesus Christ, your Holy Son who embraced death on the cross and he broke its hold over our lives. And now in this season of repentance, we can celebrate your mercy and grace. And in this late hour, we know that you are still calling all people to yourselves through the power of the Holy Spirit and the work of your church. We thank you that you've opened our minds and our eyes to the work of Christ. We thank you that you've saved us from the wrath to come. We thank you that you've enabled us to put away and turn away from the works of death and accept the life and light of your kingdom. For all these things and much, much more, we give you praise and adoration in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before you return to your seats, please turn and greet each other in the peace of Christ.
I've noticed over the, over the past several months that some of you are using the opportunity of passing the peace to get your steps in. And I commend you that you're still on your New Year's resolution after all this time. Uh, it's wonderful to fellowship. We do have more opportunities to fellowship in the uh, basement after the service. Please uh, join for that. And now we connect with not only each other, but with a history, a rich history with Christians throughout the ages in the Apostles' Creed. You'll find it on the overhead projector as we confess together, Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join in a moment of silent confession and I'll conclude the time in a corporate prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have followed the devices and the desires of our own hearts, and we have offended against your holy moral laws, and we have left undone the things that we should have done, and we have done things that we should not have done and there is no help in us. Lord, we pray that you'd have mercy on us who confess these faults and sins through Christ our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we know that in Christ we have forgiveness. For the scripture teaches, he made him to know who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him in Jesus Christ we have forgiveness please stand for our declaration um, of faith found in hymn number 139 great is thy faithfulness
Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your great faithfulness, your provision for us through the years. We trust in you, and through these tithes and offerings, we give back a portion of that which you've blessed us with. We pray that you would bless the gift and the giver. We pray that you'd use these offerings to extend your kingdom both here on Fort Belvoir and throughout the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Chapel family. Our first scripture reading this morning will be out of the Old Testament, Psalms chapter 25, verses 1 through 10, which can be found on page 459 in your pew Bibles. Our second reading will be from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22, which can be found on page 1016 in your pew Bibles. Oh my God. Sorry. I lift up my soul, O oh my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. 
Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your path. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you, I will wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those he keeps his covenant and his testimonies. And then our next reading will be Psalms 25. Right, sorry. Next will be 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. For Christ also suffered once for his sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as removable of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Good morning, congregation. It's good to see you this morning. Let us bow our heads in prayer. In praise, Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning knowing from your word that you make perpetual intercession for us. That your word tells us that you always live to intercede for us. That you are our advocate, the great mediator between us and God. We thank you, and through your name, we pray utterly, boldly, and confidently confidentially, confidently, excuse me, before you, to simply tell you, O Lord, our ultimate intercessor, of our pleadings for those of us who are in great and pressing need of your mercy, your grace, and your love. Release the powers of your providence and your blessing upon us, O Lord. We lift up this morning to you, the people of our nation, those of our neighborhoods, those in our cities and towns, and, in tho and those in this chapel's community. Begin with those who follow you and help them influence others for good, your good. Let them be salt and light, pointing others to you. Help them to exemplify your values and make them bold in your faith, in their faith in you. Raise up godly leaders who will serve you faithfully at all 
cost. Give them your mind and surround them with godly counselors who will exercise integrity and work for justice, morality, and freedom. Help them to esteem you and not dismiss you. Protect the defenseless and hold them close to your heart. We pray for our laborers to tell the good news of Jesus Christ to people around our world. Jesus, our hearts cry out for persecuted believers. Make them brave and give them your powerful protection. We pray that you will bring swift justice to those who want to destroy the innocent. Bind the power of Satan and strengthen believers everywhere. Send revival, Lord, in your name. These things we pray and believe. And Lord, we pray for all of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who are deployed, and particularly those in known and unknown places. Let your divine providence and help be with them. May you provide all that they need. And Lord, we together pray your prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And uh, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Micah, for leading us through the scripture lessons this morning, and Andre for leading us in corporate prayer. Now, if you're able, please rise for our hymn, uh, thanking God for his grace, preparing us for uh, the word. Hymn number 585, Be Still and Know. And the children may be dismissed for Children's Church.
may be seated. Uh, just a few comments before the sermon uh, this morning. So um, I want to publicly thank the chapel for their prayers for um, Art and Lucy Wittick uh, as he went through his surgery, I think it's a couple of weeks ago now, and we're very pleased that they are with us uh, this morning. So God, God answered prayers. And, um, and again, just want to thank everyone for uh, your prayers and concern for them during, during this time of recovery as well. Uh, next, uh, just to reiterate, reiterate what Chaplain Franklin shared with us at the beginning of service, um, again, we, we are going to be back here in Belvoir Chapel next week, so please come here for services next week, and then the 3rd of March will be our first service at the Resiliency Center. We will look for multiple ways to share that location, address, and, and probably even a picture or something to help make sure everybody understands where that location is and where you can park and all those kinds of things. So the pastoral staff will work with some of our volunteers this week to ensure that we get the, get the information out to everyone as, as well as we can. Um, and then finally, I, I, uh, there's probably no, nobody here more excited than I am to say farewell to Chaplain Porter next week and um, I hope you'll join in my uh, celebratory attitude next week uh, as, as we do that for him. So uh, now I, I invite you to join me in Mark chapter 1 um, this morning. You may remember the last sermon I delivered here was about the origins of humanity and the importance of understanding those origins to our lives as children of God. And today we're going to examine another origin story, this time the one of the second Adam, Jesus Christ. Now we know that the Son of God has always existed and that He was incarnated, born of the Virgin Mary, as Scripture tells us. There's no mistaking, however, that the story of Jesus in all of the Gospels is predominantly a story about the Son of God teaching and how that teaching resulted in His condemnation and later execution. So the origin story that Mark tells is not about the birth of Jesus. It is about him as a very special prophet and teacher. So let's look now at how he began this stage of his life and why it matters for us today. Join me in Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals. And the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Let's pray. Father, open our eyes to your word. May we receive your truth for our life. Know Christ better through it, and deliver to the world the message that was delivered to us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, if you read the text with me just now from your Bible, from either a pew Bible or one that you brought with us, you'll notice how very little text there is in Mark's gospel prior to this origin passage. Mark tells us, that John the Baptist was on the scene in a ministry of preaching a baptism in relation to repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And that's pretty much all that goes on there. And then all of a sudden, bam, Jesus is placed on the scene. He's placed on the stage of world history. There's no birth narrative, no story of Jesus as a child, 
Jesus just essentially appears from out of nowhere. And that begins his life's teaching and ultimately his life's purpose to the world. The evangelist Mark gives us a sense of how dynamic Jesus' arrival to public ministry really was. In this text, in rapid succession, we learn that Jesus received John's baptism, was tested in the wilderness, and then began to preach the good news. Mark starts his origin story by telling us that Jesus came out of Nazareth and went out to the Jordan like so many others had been doing to get baptized by John. Now there are two things glaringly different about Jesus' baptism from that of any other person. First, in Mark's intro, he made it clear that John was preaching a specific message about baptism. A baptism was not a new thing. Ritual, ritual washing had been part of experience for the Jewish people and really had been part of other religious experiences otherwise. But John was preaching a specific thing related to baptism. Baptism was to be in relation to a repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The text tells us that the people being baptized by John in the Jordan River were actually confessing their sins. So it was all part of this activity of people recognizing their need to turn away from their disobediences because something special was happening related to God. We know that Jesus was different from all those other people who were being baptized by John in that Jesus had no sins. There was no need for him to repent of anything. So we can ask ourselves the question, what's the point of getting dunked by John? Well, the answer is found in the second difference between Jesus' baptism and that of others. When Jesus came up out of the water, something miraculous happened. Jesus saw the heavens opened and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. He also heard a heavenly voice saying, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. You see, baptism was not a sign of repentance for Jesus. It was a sign of obedience. He didn't need to do it as a symbol of forgiven imperfections. He needed to do it to remain perfect. By doing so, he connected to a community of repentant people. In that brief interaction with John in the Jordan River, Jesus publicly identified himself with the message of repentance and forgiveness of sins while not needing repentance and forgiveness himself. And the Father acknowledged his son's status and his son's obedience. He says, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. There's some uncertainty about whether anyone but Jesus experienced the heavenly vision and voice. It seems here from Mark's gospel that only Jesus was in on that supernatural event. But regardless of whether there were any witnesses, we are told that it happened by the evangelists, and we, of course, recognize its truth. Jesus had a spiritual experience with the other persons of the Trinity in the form of a commissioning. That's what was going on here. By the Spirit descending upon him like a dove, and the voice of the Father saying, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. And there could be no better sign that the moment of public ministry for the Son of God had begun. Well, Jesus didn't get to bask in that moment. There was no party, no celebration. It was quite the opposite. The Spirit, who had just descended on him like a dove, now immediately drove him into the wilderness for temptation by the adversary. 
while baptism in the Jordan was brief, testing in the wilderness was lengthy. Jesus endured this for 40 days. Some of you may be observing the season of Lent by various forms of fasting. And you know that 40 days is a long time. Imagine observing your season of fasting while also living in the woods among the wild animals. Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness must have pushed him to his human limits. It's fair for us to ask ourselves why Jesus was tested as he was. Mark doesn't give us the meaning of it all, only that it happened. What value might there have been for the incarnate Son of God to be subjected to the temptations of the ancient adversary Satan? Was it so Jesus could demonstrate to himself the strength, his strength in the face of temptation? A strength that he would draw upon over and over and over again? Was it so Jesus could demonstrate to Satan that he would be victorious over all evil? While there may have been many purposes for this period of testing, the church has long understood the experience to have meaning to the relationship between us and our Lord. The author of Hebrews teaches us that we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Jesus, being fully God and fully human, experienced the temptations of Satan as any human might, with anguish, but he overcame them as only God can, without sin. Jesus' origin story included human suffering that we can identify with. Yes, Jesus gets us. He does understand our hunger, loneliness, sorrow, and a multitude of other human challenges. He gets us more than we tend to acknowledge. Well, in the text, following the 40 days of testing, John the Baptist was arrested. The authorities who arrested John may have expected John's message and movement to be extinguished. This is the hope of all powers who arrest political and religious dissidents. It's happened all throughout history. It happens even today. However, the flame is rarely completely extinguished when those things happen. And here, Mark tells us clearly that the message that John was preaching, that message of repentance, did not die out. John may have exited the stage, but Jesus, importantly, remained on it and began to preach the gospel of God in Galilee. Now, gospel as a word is pretty churchy. It's packed with a lot of theological meaning for us today. Because we typically use the word to specifically designate the message of salvation through the sacrificial death of Christ, or as a literary title for the Jesus stories authored by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it seems strange at first to read that Jesus preached the gospel. Jesus obviously isn't preaching the message about salvation because of his death. His death hasn't happened at this point in the story. Neither is he referencing a literary work about himself. The word Mark used was a Greek word that we would translate today as good news. Rather than translating it, it, it as such for modern English speakers, most Bible translations retain the 10th century form of the Old English compound word, Godspell, with the word God being the old form of good and spell being a word for story. So when we understand that, when we come across the word gospel in the text like this, there isn't anything confusing. 
There's not anything confusing about Jesus preaching the gospel. Jesus simply proclaimed the good news or the good story of God. What was the good news specifically? The good news specifically, the kingdom of God was at hand. This meant that a moment of time had arrived that was central to God's work in the world. Something special was going on. The reign of God began in the life and ministry of Jesus as a spiritual kingdom that will be fully manifested when Jesus returns. And this certainly is good news. It's good news for us, and it's good news for every human being alive today. But importantly, a proper response to the good news required something of those receiving it. There was more than just Jesus saying the kingdom of God is at hand. What was required? Repentance. Repentance is the turning away from sin. As scholar Jonathan Lund put it, in addition to blatant sins, this includes anything or any attitude which prevents an appropriate posture before God. Anything that offends or hinders one's relationship with the Father is to be parted with. Think about that for a moment. What does it really mean to repent? It's to part with anything in our lives that may come between us and God. And I don't know about you, but if I made a list of the kinds of things that stand between me and God, it would be the longest list I could ever imagine. And that's what repentance is. A turning away from anything that hinders my relationship with the Father. It's a hard thing. It's a difficult thing. Yes, it's good news that the kingdom of God is at hand. That's, that's easy to receive. It makes us happy. But the personal response to that good news is a difficult thing. It's difficult to turn away from all those things which hinder our relationship with our Creator. Yes, Jesus gets us on many levels. He understands our human experience. He understands our pain. He understands our sufferings. And though He has opened His arms to all with understanding, there is a prerequisite to a relationship with Him. Our responsibility to repent was made clear in Jesus' origin story. Jesus began by teaching the requirement for each individual to part with anything that created a problem between them and God. We must turn away from sin and believe. Repentance and faith. Repentance and faith remains the proper proclamation for the world today. So Jesus' origin story is just as full of foundational truths as the origin of humans in the creation account. Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. He was tested in the wilderness to prove His righteousness. And he proclaimed the necessity for people to turn away from sin toward righteousness. Jesus gets us, but was never disobedient like us. 
We were sinners who could never be righteous in God's sight. Jesus was righteous in the Father's sight until our sin was laid upon Him at the cross. And thanks be to God that when we repented and believed, the righteousness of Jesus was imputed to us. And this is our God's spell to share with others. Let us pray. Father, thank you for setting Jesus upon the stage of world history. Thank you for his righteousness demonstrated from his very beginning. Thank you for, for imputing that righteousness upon us when we repent and believe. May we always honor that gracious gift by sharing with others that Jesus loves us, that Jesus gets us, and that Jesus calls us to repentance and faith. And it's in His holy name that I pray. Amen. Please stand with me if you're able for our closing hymn, number 355. 355. There's a wideness in God's mercy. Receive this blessing, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. Amen.